learn through success and failures. Part of this is, once again, I'm going to take a little different, a little different angle at this than everybody else has taken thus far because uh, there was, I couldn't figure out how to squeeze my limited knowledge in between all the gaps that everybody else had already filled. So I came up with basically four things. And when we look at knowledge management, once again, especially in my area of work, knowledge management, a lot of times when we go talk to executives out of the gate, they think knowledge management is document management. And obviously, you know, even in this room, the fact is sometimes just the education that knowledge management is much broader and has much deeper roots than just content man management, document management, data you know, analysis, et cetera, is a big thing. So when we look at the things, I'm going to talk four things. The ties that bind, I'm going to talk about you know, how do you attach yourself to a business process so you know you've got something to grapple with. Um, nobody's school, this is an interesting one, and, and I will actually hit on a little bit of the ethics topic, as, uh, as moderately scary as that is for me, I'll do that. Um, how's that work talking about business cases? So one of the things we see, is there's a huge evolution going on around the business cases that were done for CAM type projects 18 months ago versus the ones that are being done today, and how really when you start talking, a lot of people talk about an organization with a culture of KM, I'm going to talk about a culture of how you do a business case and how you do benefits realization as part of your culture that leads to a better culture around KM. And then I'll talk about kind of a KM culture piece. So the first thing that we look at when we go into an executive's office and start talking about knowledge management, whichever aspects of knowledge management that means, is what processes are you attached to? Because our feeling is not every process and the, the knowledge and documentation and data around every process does not need to be automated. Uh, there was a conversation I had with a gentleman from Amgen yesterday that said, hey, you know, a lot of our laboratory techs and scientists still do it on paper because when we go to validation, that's a guaranteed way that the FDA knows that we validate is through that method. So not everything, not every business process should be put into uh, or wrapped around a system that encompasses KM. So part of it is you have to find the right process. And you have to understand that based on that process, the level by which you may use the technologies and some of the cultural OCM pieces will change based on how you hook to that process. Um, is the process sustainable? We have seen in the last 18 months, I've probably seen five instances where they started a KM initiative against a process that went away. Well, the problem is you've got a hanging chat, right? You've got, a, you've got now this great solution, but you have no sustainability to it because the process that really underpinned it went away. So you have to look at what's happening in the organization longer term and make sure that the process you're attaching yourself to is sustainable and will be there. Now, will it change? It'll change. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the business case part. It'll change, but it has to be a core sustainable process or you need to design for the end of life. There are systems out there that should be designed with a finite time frame, even though we don't hardly ever do that in this business. Does it have knowledge? Is there more benefit to the knowledge if it's automated or in some kind of system? Sometimes there is, sometimes there's not. And you have to, you have to validate those things. We've walked into instances where you know, they just decided to start doing everything, and the problem is when it gets down to your business case and you're 12, 18 months into it, everybody's unhappy. The end users are unhappy, the people who sponsored it are unhappy, the people who executed it are unhappy, because you have to look at what happens to that knowledge or that data once you automate it and get it into a lot of the types of repositories we've talked about in the last day and a half. Do the owners and consumers have a, have a kind of bona fide um, end in mind to the knowledge that's going through this process. Meaning, are they really, you know, is it, is it the, uh, the chicken or the pig, right, in the breakfast meal? Who's committed, who's just participating? Um, and then the last one, as I said, it, it shouldn't all be treated equal. You have to look at every piece of, whether it's a repository you're looking at augmenting, whether it's a wiki you're putting in, whether it's a knowledge base, you have to look at each one of those and make some determination as to what is the right level to take this to before you start. So here's an interesting one. This is uh, out of Toyota. And this one is one of the best cases I've seen where they tied to their consumer, when a consumer calls in with a problem, they tie into this process. So if you look at the bottom here, this is what a, 
uh, customer service rep used to have to go through to solve a problem with an end customer. Now, Toyota is complicated because they don't own the end customer. A dealer in between owns the end customer. But yet they do uh, customer satisfaction and customer management for their product. So they have a little bit more complicated process. But the nice thing is, very bona fide business value here. Sustainable process, both the consumer side and the people who managed it and sponsored it had a bona fide interest in seeing this go through and be automated. So it, was, it gave it such a powerful hook into the things they could do with it over time that it was wildly successful. Even though the business case, as I'll talk about in a minute, the business case was super static. And they, they ended up getting benefit beyond what they expected, but not in the ways they expected it. But it was still radically justified, radically successful, because they, they attached themselves to the right business process at the start. So here's, here's an interesting one. This is the balance. And when I'm talking to executives, a lot of times, the balance between how much self-interaction you want, how much information you want people to put in on their own versus how much validation you do of that. And so a lot of times what we start talking to corporations about is who is going to put the information in? What is their level of expertise to put that information in? Are they somebody that you know is a subject matter expert, is published? We frankly have had people who were subject matter experts in one subject putting content under their moniker of being an expert in another area that they really didn't know that much about. So you have to look at how you segment that as well to make sure that when the data's in, it has the right level of, of validity to it. Now, do you have to do that for everything? No, you don't. There's some things that you're just going to let freeform, but there's some things that require more um, rigor around them. And what we've seen is that the difference between success and failure in this area can be really, really fine in terms of how you apply that discipline across the different pieces of knowledge or data that's going in and who's putting it there. Um, if you looked at how critical it is, and I basically tried to give you a couple examples at the bottom. The one I'll talk most about is skills tracking. So this is a big thing right now, especially in aerospace and defense. When you look at workforce transformation, skills capture and all the knowledge around skills capture, succession planning, etc. Well, the interesting thing is, as we've found out, nobody's good at self-rating. The people who are experts underrate themselves about 90% of the time, and the junior people overrate themselves about 90% of the time. So you have this interesting mix. Well, here comes the ethics curveball. So if you have a structure that allows people to self-rate, and your guidelines for those rating criteria are somewhat gray, then whose idea could you go in ethically and change their rating? <clears throat> that may affect performance reviews, it may affect their ability to get onto certain programs or projects, it could affect their ability to be viewed as an expert or not an expert. So there's an interesting twist, and this is where we've run in probably the last 12 months into some you know, discussions with legal groups about what can you do and what can't you do, and a lot of times it came down to how clear the criteria were and how well those were followed by each one of the proficiency levels when somebody does their own skills assessment. So an interesting twist there. Um, assembly specifications. If you look at, you know, if I'm a person that's put this together once, and I go ahead and put that up in a wiki on how to do it, and somebody else comes along who's done it a lot longer, but has frankly, you know, less interest in Web 2.0, but it's wrong, do I end up pushing products out the door with a couple mistakes in them? I could. And so there's things like that that you have to look at the granularity, not just of the end product, but possibly of the assembly and other things like that, to look at what granularity you use to apply the rigor to as well. And then the last two formula, you know, I think somebody brought up the example, uh, I, I forget if it was in this room or at lunch, where you know, they went out to a subcontractor to have a product made uh, based on a formula, and the person went out to you know, Wikipedia, found the formula, created it all, and it was wrong. So they had a whole batch of product that was wrong because somebody went out to a basically a non-validator, non-verified system to get the formula to produce that product. And then discussion forums, things like that, things that really don't need a lot of um, rigor around them. So how good is your ongoing business case? So the big thing I've seen here is the difference between a business case just to get it sold and a business case to really look at success and benefits realization over time. 
So a lot of times what we've seen is people will go in, they'll build a business case, and they'll basically use any buzzword or any metric that is top of mind right then to sell it. Because somebody, some executives got to buy off on it. And they've got to show that it has enough wherewithal to put that capital towards it. What we don't find too often is that do they ask the questions around whether or not those metrics are sustainable, whether those metrics are easy to measure over time, whether they make sense, whether I can validate them on some certain time slice to go back and update that business case. Um, really early in my career, as I said yesterday, I worked on the space shuttle and I worked on, uh, basically when they launched the shuttle, I sat in the control room and decided whether or not it was good to go if there was too much ice on it. But the big thing we learned was nothing's ever perfect. It's always out of whack. The key is keeping it constantly readjusting itself so it's close enough. Business cases need to be looked at in the same manner if you're really going to derive benefit from them over time. Because they're always going to be wrong the second you're out of the gate. The problem is nobody sets them up, or very few people set them up, to be able to deal with that transition along the course of the program so that they understand how to reap those benefits over time and they keep understanding how to articulate the benefits back. So a lot of times what we find, we come in and a project's been done, and we're doing uh, you know, independent verification validation on it. And a lot of times what happens is it achieved benefits, good benefits, benefits enough to pay for itself. But they were so radically different than what everybody was looking at from the initial business case that everybody was really unhappy. And so by showing them, well, you got benefits, but here's how the path happened. It didn't go along where you thought it was going to go because of these major things that happened. And here's where you ended up with your benefits, but you got them. You just got them in a radically different way than you thought. And ultimately, you know, the light goes off and they're like, well, okay, we're happy then we got them. But the fact is, the steps that could have been taken when they were planning that business case up front and then along the path of that implementation would have gotten them there with a lot less pain. And so the culture around how do you do business planning, not just from a sales perspective internally, but from the ability to be able to maintain and sustain it over the course and show people how you derive those benefits is cultural. Right? A lot of times we walk in and people say, I need, a, I need an ROI and I need it in three days. Well, can you really do a really good ongoing business you know, justification case in three days? Probably not. You gotta do the stagnant one. The one I'm going after, I know what that person's hot buttons are, I'm gonna go after those metrics and we're gonna be done. So you need a little more time, so culturally, they have to prepare the organization that it does take more time to do these types of business cases. And there is a cultural aspect of it that when you go in and you do a SWOT analysis or you do you know, a stoplight meeting, those types of things, that there's an aspect of those that relate back to the specific metrics for your benefit realization. They have to be in that process. If they're not, everybody forgets about them until the end. Culture of KM, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of give you a couple of our snippets um, over the last day and a half and some of the discussions. There's a lot more out there. I'll give you a, kind of our big ones. Um, technology's the easy part, but frankly, it's the one that costs the money. So while a lot of people in this room always wanna say, hey, the soft stuff's the hard part, it's the hard part, but you have to understand from an executive's perspective and the people paying the bills that the technology is still the big dollar figure that they write the check for. It's kind of the, the difference between the, uh, the frog analogy that somebody used of the cold water and the boiling water, right? The capital outlay is, that, is, the, is the boiling water. You put them in, it hurts a lot. The soft stuff is all the stuff that's kind of a slow burn over time that starts to you know, boil you to death, but you don't really feel it. So you have to acknowledge the fact that even though it's the easy part, it is the part that has the visibility from the capital outlay. Um, how do you tie KM into career performance management. I mean, this is one to me that astonishes me that companies haven't taken the next step here. The fact is, unless you put metrics on people that, that make them tied into sharing, reuse, collaboration, things like that, they won't do it. At the end of the day, we're all working, well, I think most of us are working to make a paycheck so that someday we can do what we really want to do. <coughs> so the fact is, if you're gonna metric me one way, and tell me that KM's cultural, but I don't have metrics on my score sheet at the end of the year, I may do some of it, because I understand it's a good thing for the company, but I'm probably not gonna be as tied into it as you really want me to be. 
So you have to look at how you do things related to career performance management to tie it into the things you want out of your knowledge management program. Um, the next one, so how are stewards and contributors recognized and rewarded? This is so I spend a lot of my time in this workforce transformation with the generation gap. Um, and so part of it is one of the things that we've seen really help the Gen Ys is they love contributing, they love collaborating. Give them some recognition for it and you'll get a lot more out of them. It's a really easy thing to do. It's a really easy thing that we tell clients to do to start to bridge that gap. Very easy. Really small stuff goes a long way. And as, as we talked about yesterday, generationally, they are so in tune with these systems and so in tune with how this works that if you just give them a little, a little reward and recognition, it goes a long way and they can really help um, embed that into the culture. And finally, do the role models in your company set the example? You know, I thought uh, VJ, when he was talking about the fact that you know, the founders get on uh, a webcast every Friday, you can ask questions directly, all his documents are immediately posted, those type, I mean, that's a culture, right? And those, those people at the very top end that model that type of behavior set that tone. A lot of companies, we have executives that are sponsoring these types of initiatives, and if you ask them the last time they contributed something, either collaboratively to a wiki, etc., they laugh at you, because it's just not, it's not in their fabric. So the fact is, if you don't have role models that set the example, you'll never have a top-to-bottom culture of KM. It'll always be an uphill battle. So you need to look for those role models and make sure it's visible that when they do do it, they get some recognition for it as well. That's it. Any questions? <laughs> Question on this side, Joe? Go. When you do your engagements with your executives, do you use the subjective data that they produce, or do you? How do you define your current state in terms of do you do you knowledge map, do you do social network analysis tools? Uh, which is a better approach, using the expertise of something you do, or providing objectivity to helping them? How do you improve? So a lot of times, what we do is we we baseline both internal to the company to external competitors and then to best of breed next off industry. And so we'll actually use a three aspect way to do it because to your point, you can't just look internal to the company. And a lot of times you can't just look to their closest competitor because as an industry, a lot of them have the same norms around them. And so what we'll do is we'll look closest competitor in industry and then we'll look at next adjacent industry and best of class in that. Yes, sir. Can you just give an example of what you're talking about from when you talk about KM? I suspect that what Rich Brennan talked about, your knowledge to the warrior on the battlefield, doesn't have an ROI like you're talking about. Uh, you, you, would you be hard sure. about different yeah, I, you It sounds like we're talking about something different. Here. Yeah, I'm mainly, I'm mainly talking about knowledge management as it relates to um, programs internal to a corporation. It's, it just so happens that my area of this happens to be workforce transformation with highly technical engineers. But it could be, we've seen, you know, even in the Toyota example, the KM initiative was more around the customer satisfaction because if you look at Toyota's customer satisfaction three, four years ago, for the first time in the history, they weren't, you know, number one. So that's, so it was that as well. But it's mainly around KM initiatives in an enterprise. So again, just a little bit of pushback. If you go back to last year where we talked about the floor example. I wasn't here last year. Okay, so, so they do a great <laughs> job with COPs, community okay. practices, sharing globally. And they say, you know, it's worthless for us to try to measure, quote, the ROI, but they do an awesome job of collecting stories. And they know what the value is. They know there's huge enterprise value, but they would never put a dollar value on their KM effort. Which again sounds different than the approach you're taking. Right. So what I, I I would put it on the efficiencies of the processes you hang off of more than just on the KM effort itself. Does that make sense? So it'd be more it'd be more from a um, if you go backwards, it, it'd be more around BPM type stuff than it would the KM. The KM is just, in, in my opinion, a facilitation of you know somebody used it yesterday, right? We're in, we got to do work. I agree with that. 